Welcome to this service on Sunday the 17th of May. Uh, we've started a little series in Ecclesiastes which have given the name Life Under the Sun. This is wisdom for us to live by. Listen to a verse which comes in the chapter we're going to look at today, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19. When God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lots and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. Well, we get to sing our first hymn today, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. And I hope that you're able to join him, find some words at home as we sing the praises of the one who's our maker as well as our redeemer. It's good to be able to praise God. It takes us our, our eyes off ourselves, puts them on him, the one who's our maker and redeemer. We're now going to come with humility as we admit where we've gone wrong, as we dedicate ourselves to God's service in the future. It's a prayer of confession and I invite you just to bow your heads as I lead us in a prayer now. Almighty God, we come in the name of the promised one who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. We confess that we've not bowed before him or acknowledged his reign as king. We confess that we have treated as precious the things of earth while neglecting the things of heaven. May we learn to be content with all that you have given to us as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Forgive us and raise us from sin, that we may be your faithful people, following our Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
And the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for all sinners who repent. So hear these words which encourage us that we are forgiven through Jesus. We learn in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Gracious Lord, may we know grace and peace that you alone can grant through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A further prayer, the set prayer for this Sunday, the sixth after Easter. God our Redeemer, you've delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. We quite often have a statement of faith, a short statement called a creed, and these are some verses taken from the Bible, which are some of the earliest statements of faith which we can use for ourselves. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body of the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. I'm going to lead us in a few prayers now and uh, I again invite you to pray with me and what I'm going to do to start with is to uh, use the Lord's Prayer in the traditional form, I hope you know these words and we'll say these words together before I lead us in a few more general prayers and then another set prayer at the end. So let's just bow our heads to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, let's take a moment to pray for others. Uh, we've started with praise and thanksgiving to God and now we turn to intercede for the sake of others and today we're going to specifically think about how there are many who are in need we ourselves may be in great need but we can bring those before God as well as praying for others so Heavenly Father we want to remember before you those who are sick at this time it may be through the Covid virus it may be for other reasons. And so we bring their names before you, remembering how you healed the sick in your ministry on earth amongst your disciples. And this testified to the fact that you truly are the Son of God, our Messiah. We pray today we may trust in you. We may look in faith to you, the one who is our health and our salvation. We also remember, Lord, those who are lonely. The self-isolation and the distancing have brought this loneliness to the surface for many. And we long, Lord, for the day where we can be reunited with our loved ones. And so, Lord, we remember all who are lonely at this time. We also remember those who have been bereaved, who have lost a loved one, and they wish it were not the case. There's that sense of longing, the longing to be united, the longing to share life again, and yet that's been brought short. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that there's a verse in one of the Psalms which reminds us that you're close to the brokenhearted. We pray that we may take courage from this and turn to you in our times of deepest despair. We also remember, Lord, those who suffer with mental health conditions, some are 
feeling very depressed. Others have lost hope of life. And we pray you be near to them and strengthen them. Jesus said, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. We long, Lord, that all who suffer in this way may know how it is that they can come to you and receive your encouragement that you may take the weight from their shoulders and lead them into life. And there may be other more general needs that we want to bring before God. There are some who are struggling financially at this time and we pray for their needs to be met for the system of social care and help to meet them at this time. That you teach us to be generous people with what we have, with those who have little. We pray too, Lord, for those who are anxious about their work and the difficulties of knowing whether to return or not. We pray for wisdom at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. The reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verses 1 to 20. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner, except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a labourer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labour that he can carry in his hand. This too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs. And what does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction and anger. Then I realised that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labour under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work. This is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Well, the pandemic and social distancing is certainly making us have a rethink. One discussion is going on as to whether this kind of new frugality that everyone's discovered is going to last. Or, as another one person has put it, are we going to revert to spending money we don't have on things we don't need to create an impression that won't last on people we don't care about? How are we to live life under the sun? Well, Ecclesiastes charts out a pathway which is much wiser. Ecclesiastes helps us to face up to whether our life is being well spent. It's looked at how we've invested in many activities in life, but have that tendency to neglect knowing God. That's the opening few chapters. And what he does now in this chapter 5 is to highlight the priority of a life captivated by God, who alone is righteous and holy. It warns us against deceitful worship and a desire for wealth. And both of these symptoms are of a life that is not captivated by God. Well, the writer begins in this chapter looking at a life untouched by grace in the first seven verses. He gets us to think about what is at the heart of our devotions. What is the focus of our worship? We might actually be quite keen to go to church and we're really missing it at the moment. Or maybe we love to sing the songs. Or maybe we enjoy being entertained and we're eager to see the numbers of the church grow. But we're warned. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. The importance of listening to God's word is the priority. I wonder whether you remember Jesus' line when he says in John chapter 14, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Why does Ecclesiastes write about this? I guess because the tendency is that we simply make use of God. He serves our concerns. He helps our cause. But this really is like a rabbit's foot theology, treating God as if he's a lucky charm or an insurance policy. It makes big promises, as verse 2 mentions, but it's got no follow through. It is better to not make a vow than to make it and not fulfil it, we read. Well, that reminds me of a parable that Jesus told of two sons. The first, well, when he was asked by his father to go and work in the vineyard, refuses, but then changed his mind later on and got on with it. The second son agreed straight away, but, well, he failed to go. And Jesus commends the son who takes the action. Well, we're not to take God's grace for granted. There's to be a reality in worship we're to actually walk the talk. And the writer shakes us out of any complacency when he adds in verse 7, therefore stand in awe of God, remembering who it is that we serve. There are some other examples in the Bible of this working out, the first being King Saul, who offered many sacrifices, but his heart was untouched. And Samuel delivered this withering line to him, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. The church in Corinth in the New Testament, they met as a church, but they failed to break with sin and face judgment. In 1 Corinthians 10, they're taught about this. And then in the next chapter, when Paul's writing about the Lord's Supper, he says to them that they're not actually remembering the sheer cost of their forgiveness. And they're treating these things as if they don't matter very much. You see, only a life captivated by God will be touched by his grace. But then also the writer speaks to us about a life consumed by wealth. The writer now recalls how wealth is often at the expense of injustice, and this is what he mentions in verses 8 to 9. Uh, When we turn to the New Testament, we read James condemning such things, saying, that, well, God sees and he will judge the rich oppressor. And the theme here in Ecclesiastes is that wealth is not a measure of the fullness of life. It can, in fact, corrupt us. Verse 10, whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. You see, a desire for more is never really satisfied. 
We can make massive profits and then still want for more. We may gamble all the way as we pursue a great, great dream for more. We, we may live for what we can get rather than realising that a desire for wealth now controls our lives. Well, it's important to learn the lesson that we get in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not saying that every evil is due to money, but it answers for a lot of evil. The God-shaped hole in our hearts will only ever be satisfied with the giver and not his gifts. Paul tells Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides for us with everything for our enjoyment. Ecclesiastes also goes on to remind us how wealth can bring anxiety. When it says in verse 12, the sleep of a labourer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of rich man permits him no sleep. There's so much to think about and work and plan on. But wealth, wealth can also be a false friend. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, he says in verse 13. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. I wonder whether you know the poem that picks up on a, a well-known saying. And in the final verse of this poem, it says this. God says, on earth you were rich and famous, you stood out in a crowd, but you cannot take it with you. There are no pockets in a shroud. Ecclesiastes is telling us that a life that desires God's glory will not be consumed by wealth's corrupting influence. And so we need to get that right. And so it is that Ecclesiastes encourages us to make God's glory our aim and enjoy what he gives us. It's not just about learning to be content and leading a simple life, though that's important, but also knowing that God is the key to life. When our lives are touched by grace and our desires for God's glory, then we will begin to know life in all its fullness in this life under the sun. So I'm going to now use an old prayer called the General Thanksgiving, which helps to put into words and a prayer to God that we may live as people who are captivated by God. A general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all mankind. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be sincerely thankful. Give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be sincerely thankful so that we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our next song, a more modern song, picks up this idea of when we prize God above all things, then we lead the life in the way he wants us to live, in life under the sun.
Well, it's been a short service together. I hope it's been a great blessing to you. Here's a couple of prayers to finish our time together. Eternal God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life, grant us to walk in his way, to rejoice in his truth and to share his risen life, who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. And we pray for God's blessing upon us. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. I hope that uh, you're able to join us next time we have a service. Uh, we're hoping to do one for Ascension Day and then again on Sunday. There are also some backdated services which you'll find on the Christchurch website. I uh, look forward to you joining us then.